So we're in graduation season. Uh, come on, students. Some of you seniors, you are graduating. Some of you college students, congratulations to you. You're graduating. Um, no one really cheers for you when you get your master's and doctorate. I'm just telling you, only your family at that point. Um, but hey, it's, it's a great season. And I know some of you probably getting senioritis. Some of you high school students. It set in for me around my sophomore year. God, anybody else? Come on, show of hands in the house of God. Anybody got senioritis? Okay, I was only in my sophomore year. I had senioritis bad. I was ready to be done with school. That's why it's a miracle that I have my doctorate. Uh, my mom is the most surprised. <laughs> I did not like school at all. I did not excel in school. Um, but we're in this season of graduating. Thank, the great thing about graduation is this, is that you're closing a chapter and you're beginning a new one. Uh, the another thing about graduation is this, it's so great, and this is what I thought, um, is I'll never have to revisit that again. I am done with that season. It is over with. I can move on from it. Hey, you know the great thing about your doctorate is you never have to go to school again. <laughs> That's one of my motives. I will never need to go to school again. There'll, there'll be no more goals out there in front of me. Um, but the thing is, when you graduate, you get to move on from it. Like, you're done with that season, and... I think sometimes in our faith that we can think that. We can think, oh, I've graduated from that. That was whenever I was newly walking with Jesus. Or, or I've kind of I've graduated from serving. You know, I, I did that whenever I was really on fire for God. Or I've kind of graduated from community. I, I don't really need that anymore. I'm, I'm maturing in my faith. And if we're not careful, we think that there are some things we graduate. Can I tell you something, though, today? There are some things in your life and in your faith you never graduate from. Come on, my mom had let me know whenever I left the house. I did not graduate from calling and checking in with her. And if you're able to do that, how many of you know? You don't graduate from calling mom, right? Like, there are just some things you don't graduate. And I want to propose to you today that you don't graduate from grace. There never comes a moment in your Christian walk. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus two weeks and you said yes and raised your hand at Easter. Or if you've been walking with Jesus for decades, you never graduate from needing the grace of God, from embracing the grace of God, from living. We, we are on borrowed grace. Every single day, I'm living on the grace of God. I'm walking on the grace of God. And so I wanna, I wanna walk us through because Paul begins Galatians with grace, and in chapter six, he ends it with grace. It is grace through and through, and I just wanna be a reminder in this season that you and I are in need of the grace of God, and we're living on the grace of God. And so what does that really mean? We're going to dive into that. I want us to, remember I told you, I want to help you learn to study the Bible. And some of you are like, I don't study. I'm like you, I didn't do good in school. Well, maybe we could, uh, maybe we could not say study the Bible. I want to teach you how to ingest the Bible. How about that? Is that some of you like, I like eating? I will take that. I want to digest the Bible, all right? I like a good meal. I want to, I want to help you understand it. So it starts out, and the first thing it lets us know is who wrote the book. And Paul says, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and so we were know right there, the Apostle Paul, he wrote over the half of the New Testament. This is what's called a pastoral epistle. And so it's, it's letters that Paul is writing with a pastor's heart to churches that he's planted. Now, he planted churches a little different than, than a lot of people do today. You know, Tammy and I had the privilege of, of planting this church, and, and we've been here 19, next year be 20 years that that we've been here as a church. Paul, he would plan a church, get it up and running. He was a serial planner, if you're with me. He was like serial entrepreneur. Paul was like, y'all good? I'm out. And then he'd start another church. He'd be like, y'all good? You got, okay, I'm out. I'm moving on. And this is kind of Paul's method. And so he would move on from church to church. But he would write letters back to the church, often for encouragement and a lot of times for correction. Going, hey, I, I, you're getting a little wonky in your doctrine here. Hey, you're doing some things, you're, you're, and hey, you need to quit that. Stop that, you know, and then he'd make a list. <laughs> like, stop doing that. And, and he, was, he was helping pastor these people along. And so he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And, and he says, not sent from men or by men. Now, this is important. Because Paul is establishing his authority. So he, what he's saying is, what I'm about to tell you I didn't, I wasn't called by some people and I wasn't sent by some group of people. Jesus himself met me on the road to Damascus and the message I am bringing you, I was sent by him, from him, and the message I'm about to give you is from him. So Paul's trying to establish 
his authority because in, in ancient Roman culture, um, if you were sent to deliver a message, that message you were sent to deliver would only carry value if who sent you had authority. And so I want you to know something. The word of God has authority, not because Paul penned it, but because it came from the one who has ultimate authority, okay? If you're with me, come on, everybody put your hands together, all right? And then he says to the church at Galatia, so he's letting us know who he wrote it to. And so like a Philippians, he's writing to Philippi. Corinthians, he's writing to the church in Corinth. So these are just little things as you read the Bible and you're kind of beginning a a section of maybe a letter. You're gonna find out who the author is. You're gonna find out who was it originally written to. Um, This is called getting things in good context. Um, And then usually, usually Paul at the beginning of a letter would go, um, he would do the grace and peace. And then he'd be like, and I hear you're excelling in this. And I hear, you know, he would like, um, you ever corrected someone like, or, or been corrected at the office and they start out with a lot of like sugar and then they drop the hammer and then they give you a lot more shit like, hey, you're killing it in here. You're horrible here, but we really love you. And, you know, Paul would kind of give it that approach. He'd be like, you're killing it here and grace and peace. And, and I hear that so-and-so is doing amazing. And then he would correct them. And at the end, he'd be like, and I love you. And you can tell by my words, I'm affectionate towards you. Not in the Galatia. Paul comes out the gate throwing fist, everybody. Like he's coming out of the gate and he's like, I'm astonished. What's your problem? You know, that's kind of what he's saying. And he says, I'm astonished that you're picking up another gospel. So here's what's happening in the context. If you're with me, say amen. Here's what's happening in the context. Most scholars believe that there were Jewish people that were coming to faith in Christ. And they were bringing with them a lot of their Jewish doctrine and belief about temple worship, about sacrifice, about Sabbath, about all these different things. And so they were coming into the church and they were going, they were, they were saying, hey, it's Jesus, but it's also this. It's Jesus plus Make sure you're keeping the Sabbath and you're not walking so many steps and, and you're not going, you're not eating certain foods and, and it's Jesus, but also make sure that, that you do the sacrifice. Yeah, it's Jesus, but also make sure that, that you, uh, you know, are doing the ceremonial cleansing and all these kind of things. And Paul is saying this and he uses really strong language. He says, he says, I'm, I'm bewildered that we gave you the gospel. The gospel is simply a word that means good news. The good news is this, is that you and I were lost in our sin. We had no way of solving the problem. Jesus came and he died on the cross on our behalf and he shed his blood that we could have forgiveness of sins. Good news. Why is it good news? Because there's really bad news. We're lost without him. The good news is with him. We have salvation and freedom and hope and joy and purpose and destiny and all these other wonderful things that come with them. And so he said, you've gone to a different gospel a different good news. And, and he uses strong ranges. He uses the same language that would be used of someone deserting their country or deserting the army. In the original language, the Bible, the New Testament is written in Greek. In the Greek, it has this idea of a deserter of a military group or a deserter of a country, someone who has betrayed or turned their back on. So, so get this, Paul is saying, if you add anything else to Jesus, you are following a different gospel. And the enemy and ourselves and religion wants to make it Jesus plus something. But I want to remind you, it is the grace of Jesus, period. That's what Paul's trying to tell him. It is grace only. So what is grace? Well, um, I grew up remembering it this way, an acronym. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's G-R-A-C-E. It's God's riches. All that heaven has to offer, God has put on you. But it came at Christ's expense on the cross. It cost him his life, but we get all that heaven has to offer. We get forgiveness. We get purpose. We get relationship. We get the presence of God. What is grace? It's all the richness of heaven. It is all the richness of God, but it came at a very expensive price, and it was Christ and his life. And so it's God's grace. It's, any, it's goodness in our life. It's the, it starts at the forgiveness of sin. The grace of God is what forgave our sin. I wanted to read this to you. One scholar said it this way, and I thought it was really smart because scholars are. 
Grace is God's unconditioned goodwill toward mankind, which is decisively, I love that word, expressed in the saving work of Christ. It is God's unconditioned goodwill. In other words, it's not, God's not saying it's, it's Sabbath plus Jesus. No, it's unconditioned. It's if you get your act together plus Jesus. It's if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps plus Jesus. If you check enough religious boxes plus Jesus. No, it is God's unconditioned goodwill towards humanity decisively given to us at the cross. This is what grace is. And it's, it's why the psalmist or the hymn writer said, it's amazing because it's so hard to get our minds around because we in human interaction don't often receive things without something attached to it. If you do this for me, then I'll, I'll do this for you. If you give this to me, then I'll give this to you. Even if they give it freely, you're like, eh, is there something coming later down the road? You know, hey, hey, can you help me move that piano? Remember that thing I did for you three years ago? Like there was something attached to it. Hello, somebody. But God's unconditioned, unconditioned goodwill towards humanity. God has, un, listen to me, look at me. God has unconditioned goodwill towards you. He wants to give to you. It's called grace. It's grace. It's seen in the forgiveness of sins primarily, but it's also seen in that you woke up today. It's the grace of God. You got relationships in your life. You may not love them all, but the ones you like, grace of God. <laughs> <laughs> it's God's unconditioned. Let me get that in your mind, unconditioned, because some of you, you've grown up so religious that you are still trying to earn what God has unconditionally given to you. Now, Pastor, but does that mean I just get grace and I can live like I want? No, but we'll talk about that later in this series. Come back. <laughs> I just want to get this deep into your spirit that it is grace, period. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. There's nothing I could do to gain it. I can't do enough hoops, jump through enough things, pastor well enough, read my Bible enough, pray enough, worship so many hours, serve enough. I can't do anything. God gave it to me freely. It's amazing. And anything in your life that wants you to add something to your standing with God other than Jesus is a different gospel. Paul goes on to say, he says, I don't care who te taught it to you. If an angel came up and said it to you, he said, it's wrong. It's grace only. And a lot of people, especially religious people, they get nervous around grace teaching. Because they're like, yeah, but don't forget to tell them they got to act right and they got to change their ways and they got to, but grace will cause you to do that. If you'll get a revelation that there was nothing I could do, but it was all grace that came to me, it'll put a want to in your heart to love Jesus and to serve him. I just want to drill in in this first installment that it is grace only. So how do I keep from adding things to grace? then uh, I'm going to give you four R's, all right? Four R's. So write these down. Listen quickly, okay? And we're going to get through these. Number one is remember. Number one is remember. Is to remember what Jesus did for you. Is to remember in that, the Bible says, in that while we were still far from God, Christ died for us. In that while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. For us, and there's nothing, I want to get this into our hearts as a church so much. There's nothing we could do to solve that problem. Uh, Ephesians 2 8 says this it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. You did have a part, you had to extend faith, but it was by grace. And it's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. In other words, there's not enough religious things you did. Well, I got confirmed. Why well, I get through communion? That didn't say grace is what saved you. The unconditioned goodwill of God towards humanity decisively shown to us on the cross is what gave you forgiveness of sin and peace with God. This is the foundation of your faith. Uh, you got to remember. Let, let, me, let me illustrate it to you like this. Um, I have a couple of permanent markers, right? And uh, which means that I can't wash this out, right? I can't get this stain out of my clothes. And I think this kind of represents our sin, right? It may, it's a lot more ugly than this. 
But there's, these are permanent. Like, it doesn't matter how, how, what, how many Tide pins you have in your purse right now. Come on, all the moms, get up an amen right now, right? It doesn't matter how much bleach or Clorox I put. These are permanent markers. It, I, I may be able to do something to fade the richness of the color, but I won't remove the color. And so here's what religion wants you to do. It wants you to go, I can, get, I can take care of this. I can fix this. But it would be like doing this, looking in the mirror and going, wow, I've got stains on my shirt. And then going, I'm gonna see if this mirror can't like get them off me. This is what happens when we come in contact with the gospel. All of a sudden, I've got a problem I can't solve. And religion and our own effort will tell us, well, maybe I can take the mirror off the wall and fix this. No, no, no. The mirror just shows me I have a problem. The mirror just shows me I need to shave. The mirror can't shave for me. The mirror can't wash it for me. Are you following me? So when I look at the Bible and if you're frustrated going, I don't measure up, I can never measure up. I can't keep all these rules and all these rituals. It's like you trying to wash the shirt. All the Bible does is expose that you got stains. All the Bible does is expose that there are some sin issues in our life and attitudes and things, and it was born into our DNA. And religion goes, we'll do better. We'll scrub it out. We'll try harder. That's like expecting the mirror to wash me. The mirror of God's word can only show me that I've got some issues. It is only grace that can wash me. It is only grace that can cleanse me. It is only grace that can take a hard heart and make it soft. It is only grace that can take a foul mouth and make it clean. It is only grace that can cause an addict to become clean. It is grace alone. Come on, it's grace today, everybody. And if every so often in my life, if I'll remember There was nothing I could do to fix this. All I could do was stare at it. All I could do was maybe fade the richness of the color. And we do that, don't we? We hide it. We cover it. Right? Coming to church with a smile on. And at best, we're covering the stains, the brokenness, the sin, the issues. And then we go back to our week trying to use a mirror to wash it and clean it up. Hopefully, hoping we can scrub it enough to get it clean, and you never can. That's why some of you, you you quit church because you're so frustrated with religion because you thought you had to get yourself clean. You thought you were the Savior. But can I tell you something? It's grace, and it's amazing, and it's, mysterious that a holy God who can't even be around this mess would come and give himself and carry all of my mess so that I could be forgiven. That's grace. It's unconditioned. It's not deserved. And so if every so often we were to stop and go, wow, I didn't get here by myself. And I didn't forgive myself. And every good and perfect gift I have has come from the Father above, and it was all grace. It's grace that I'm standing before you today. It's grace that I'm forgiven. It's grace that I'm breathing. It is all grace. And some of you, you're trying to take the mirror and wash yourself, and it'll never work. So remember, how do you keep from adding something to Jesus? Just remember it was only grace. Only grace. Number two is remain in grace. Why would you continue? Why would you not continue in what you started in? I love what what Paul says, and and we'll see this later, but in Galatians chapter three, he says, um, again, he's a little harsh, everybody, okay? Okay. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Here's what he's saying. When you came to Jesus, you're like, I I, I got nothing. I need your forgiveness. 
then why are you foolish enough to go, I got it now, Jesus? No, it started in grace, and it has to continue in grace. It started in grace. You have to remain in grace. Well, what does that mean, Pastor? It just means that I'm, I'm continually going, no, God, this, this is grace. This, I'm going to continue to grow in this realization that everything I have, that as you peel back the layers of my life and as you begin to work this, this process of growing in grace, as you begin to grow me and, and go, hey, let's deal with that and hey, let's, 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 let's chisel that off of your life and let's smoothen out that edge of your life, that it is grace that I need the grace of God every day. I didn't graduate from it. There's no graduating from grace. It's not a chapter I can close on my life. Well, whenever I first met Jesus, man, I really did it. No, no, no. If you've been walking saint with Jesus for 40 years, you are desperately in need of grace today as you were the day that you met him. I'm desperately in need of grace today as I was 30 years ago. I want to remain in the grace of God. Second Peter 3.18 says this, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him both now, to be glory both now and forever, amen. Peter says, hey, you need to keep growing in grace. You don't graduate from it. There doesn't come a moment where you're like, I kind of got this, I got this locked down, got this figured out. You haven't come to some place of sinless perfection unless you're Jesus. I don't think you are. No, you're, you're continually growing in grace. Growing in grace. Number three is the word repel. How do, how do I not do what the church was doing in Galatia? I got I to gotta repel anything that is Jesus plus. And here's where I think you have to repel it the most is in your own mind, your own heart. Because it's so easy to be in this journey of faith and at some point think, I'm doing pretty good. Got myself here. The moment you say that it's Jesus plus you, it's Jesus plus, and it ain't, it's Jesus, period. It's grace, period. So my own heart, my own mind, I'm gonna repel anything that thinks I have standing with God because of anything other than grace in my life. Come on, are you following me? Say amen. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna, not gonna serve and not gonna do all these things that I do, but I do them, why? Because I received grace that was amazing and I couldn't think of any other way to respond in love than to serve God with the rest of my life, right? But I got to remember my starting point, it was grace. Paul's going, I'm astonished. I gave you the gospel. And so quickly, you've let some false teachers come in and pull you away to make it Jesus plus something else. And he said, it is the grace of Jesus alone. Look at this, 2 Peter 3, 17 says this, says, therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. That's really strong language. It's back to this idea that, of what Paul said. Peter's kind of given the same idea that, hey, when you divert from the gospel, it is a different gospel. You're no longer following Jesus. You're following some other person's man-made idea of Jesus plus something else. And he says, don't, don't get out of that. There's a security in that position to go grace and grace alone. Here's why it's secure is because you didn't put yourself there. God put you there. And if God put you there, no man can take you out of it. I want you to get this. If it's Jesus that saved you, it's the grace of God that sustains you, then I didn't do it, so my best day and my worst day, as the song says, I'm still a child of God. Why? Because my, my, my security in Jesus, me being in the palm of his hand, isn't because Daniel put myself there. I didn't preach my way there. I didn't read my Bible the way there. I didn't worship my way there. I didn't serve enough my way there. It was the grace of God that reached down and pulled me out of my mess, and it is him. If he's holding me, he can keep me. So I'm going to repel anything else. And then here's the last one, is remember again. Just cycle back <laughs> and keep cycling back. 
because it is grace alone. Remember, remember the moment where the Holy Spirit illuminated the mess. The mirror showed the reflection. You ever heard the saying, the mirror don't lie? (laughs) Remember the moment the mirror didn't lie. Said, yeah, that attitude, yeah, that brokenness, yeah, that pride, yeah, that envy, yeah, that impurity, yeah, that thought. Remember the moment, remember again, and there was nothing you could do to fix it. But what happened? Grace showed up. Grace showed up. And it did what you could never do. And so much more. So Paul's encouraging the church in Galatia. Pretty hard language. I'm astonished that you so quickly have gone away from it. I'm more of an encourager. I've been like, hey guys, why are you going to the other? So I just want to encourage you, don't don't let somebody add, don't let yourself add Jesus plus something else. It is grace alone, and it really is amazing. You receive the word today? Come on, you receive it? Hey, let's pray together. Every campus, even online if you're able to, every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you're here today, and you've never received the grace of God by faith. It's by grace and through faith you are saved. Maybe up to this point you're realizing that you've, you've done religion, you tried your best to work your way to God, but you've never received the free gift, the grace of God, the forgiveness of sin, the unconditioned goodwill of God towards humanity, decisively shown to us in the cross. And if you'd like to do that today, I wanna to give you the opportunity just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's nothing magical in the prayer, but if you mean it from your heart to God's heart, then, and you pray it by faith and on the authority of God's word, you will be saved. The Bible says that we've all sinned. The marks on the shirt, we all have our mess. And the wages of that sin is death. It's eternal separation from a loving God. God never wanted it that way. So he sent Jesus to live the life you and I could never live. He died the death you and I deserved. He paid the penalty for our sin. He's paid the price. Remember, it's God's riches at Christ's expense so that you and I could have forgiveness of sin. And the Bible says that if we'll confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is our act of faith. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that's the resurrection, then we will be saved. And so today I wanna give you an opportunity to do that to make that your confession by faith and to freely receive the grace of God right now in this moment. And so if that's you, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I I, I need the grace of God. I want that in my life. I wanna know my sins are forgiven. I need a brand new beginning today. If that's you, I'm gonna count to three. When I do, you just shoot up your hand high enough, long enough for myself or your campus pastor to see. No one's gonna come to you or point you out. We're not gonna embarrass you in any way. Just want to know who I'm praying with, and I believe this is your first act of faith. It's just saying, God, this is me. It's me. So if that's you on three, you shoot your hand up. One, two, three. You shoot it up high in the air. Just keep it up. Incredible. You can put it down. Church, let's pray this out loud for the benefit of those who just slipped up their hands today. Say, Jesus, I need you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. Today, I'm making my Lord and Savior. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who made that decision.